then what we gon' hey. say info? Yeah. Hey, send a couple shots, let's make a toast. Huh. Whole party going up, cause there's only one way to go. Welcome everyone, it's your girl Rima, and I'm here with Miami's very own Ice Billion Bird. Say hi to the What's up, what's up, man? So, I just want to start off with the name, Ice Billion Bird. Where did the billion come in and why the change? Um, it was never a change. You know, I've been calling myself Billion since I named myself Iceberg. And um, if you look back up to my first mixtape, it said Iceberg, a.k.a. Billion on there. But what happened was I had to start legally using Ice Billion Bird so it could di differentiate um, from the time that I got out my last record deal to now, you know? So when you look up online and stuff, all my new stuff is under Ice Billion Berg and not just Iceberg and stuff. And it's better for search engine, engine purposes, you know? When you type in Iceberg, don't you know shit from Antarctica pop up and stuff, you feel me? So yeah, that's why I had to just legally incorporate the Billion in my name. But yeah, my name was always Billion. I was playing around in high school. I used to call myself Ice Big and Shrub Bird. So I just, it was like some kiddie shit, but it grew up into, you know, it, I guess it added this aura to me. Billion, like billion is a lot. Billion is big, you feel me? Yeah. So, you know. Okay, so. The name. So speaking of that transition. Yeah. Was it challenging for you to transition from being, to being a fully independent artist? What challenges did you face? Um, yeah, it did. It, um, far as challenging, it was not too much of a challenge for the simple fact that uh, I've been like accustomed to just pushing myself as an artist. You know, I've been accustomed to getting behind my own self and putting my own money into myself. So it really wasn't no big challenge as far as the, the, the transition, but it was a challenge from the public point of view. You know, the public didn't understand what was going on. The public just know me doing this and doing that to doing this, you know? So a lot of people didn't understand, like, oh, what's going on? You supposed to bend blue up. Oh, you supposed to bend, you supposed to blow up, da 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 And it was, it was like, nah, this how I'm, I'm rocking like this, you know? I'm, this how, this is the route I'm cho I chose. So, you know, even now people just starting to understand and see that, what it mean to be an independent artist, you know? As far as South Florida goes, you know, a lot of people ain't understand independent artists in some South Florida, Florida period, in the South too much, but now people starting to understand what it takes, you know? Okay, how would you say that you have evolved from, you know, when you first started doing music to now being independent, putting out your own music and having to wear both hats of being, yeah. you know, the businessman and also the artist? Uh, I would say I, I evolved a lot as far as my business mind, you know, um, when I first started rapping, I didn't know nothing about the music industry at all, you know. Only reason I learned about the music industry because I was kind of forced to learn about the music industry to overcome certain situations I went through, you know, and um, get through certain obstacles that I was faced with. So when I started learning the business more, I got more more open-minded and stuff and I got wiser. So it kind of affected my maturity levels a lot, you know, through my music, but it ain't nothing really changed. I'm still the same dude. I still got the same interests as getting money, partying, smoking weed, you know, a little warfare here and there, but I'm still the same guy. I'm just more smarter with it, you feel me? So I say it changed for the better, of course. Okay, and what inspired that change for you to want to venture out into becoming your own businessman, not only yeah, like I say, I was forced to, you know, for certain situations that I'm not even technically allowed to speak on legally, but I was just forced to, and um, I, um, you know, I overcame it. I, I was the victim in that, that little episode, you know. Um, I got my independence, you know, I got my freedom, and I'm able to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, why I want to do it, and when I want to do it, and that was the ultimate goal for me was to just say, man, like I just, I want to take full control, full responsibility of my career. So when I get up or when I go to sleep, if I'm at a, at a, at a shaky place for that month or that the year, I can't blame nobody but myself, you know? And you know, I got a lot of cool nights now, you know, I go to sleep comfortably now, being that I am in control of my own career. You feel me? Okay, so you said that you were 
understand. Mm -hmm. So you just dropped three mixtapes within the yeah. last three months. Yeah. What is it that has you going so hard? Oh man, I just was dealing with a lot personally, you know, and a lot, um, like when I say personal, it was just like a, a personal goal. Like I always walk in the studio and hype up my boy DJ on the beat, which is my engineer hype up on um, Bushy B is the artist I'm working with now. And I just say, man, y'all niggas don't go to sleep, man. Y'all, we at war. Who we at war with our old self? You know, so I was just really trying to prove to my old self, that young guy that, nah, you ain't messing with the new bird, you know? So it was just a like personal challenge that I had in my mind to see how much music can I put out without, um, without, how, what word I'm looking for, without hurting my brain. Yeah, I was trying to put out the most music I can in the fastest amount of time without hurting my brain. So that's where I'm at with it now. And I just got a point to prove to myself and my old self and everybody that doubted my old self, you know, that I'm coming full speed. It's a reason why I'm saying I'm one of the biggest independent artists in Florida. It's a reason why I say I'm considered one of the best. And I'm going to show people why people consider me the best out of Florida, you know, why people been considering me the best. And that's through my musical skills, you know, and that ain't got nothing to do with gimmicks. That ain't got nothing to do with extra PR work. That ain't got nothing to do with, you know, tactics to get more famous. This just got strictly to do off grind, you know, groundwork, music, and muscle. That's it. Okay, and so I know you put out Flame, and you said that with Flame, you just went in the studio and kind of just let it all out. Yeah. Is that the same thing that you did with these last releases? Yeah, a lot of, honestly, a lot of the songs was recorded around the time I was recording Flame. So when I when I put out Flame, I dropped like 18 tracks, I think 17 tracks, but that was like 17 out of 100 tracks, you know? So a lot of the music that I'm putting out now is probably music that I recorded around that time that just ain't fit the mold. It's probably music that I just had to hook and ain't really, um, drop verses or ha ain't really have no verses for the hook at that time it was a lot of the, the, a lot of the beats sounded different you know and i recorded in my own studio we got our own everything our own engineer our own producer so our music is fully flexible you know we could change some shit that we recorded last year and make it sound like it was recorded yesterday you know and that's the the, the privilege i got by um producing music from my own spot, you feel me? So a lot of that music, I won't say old, but it's just like a mixture of a lot of things. So you would get some songs that might sound like it was supposed to be on Flame, or it probably, I probably had the same tone or the same mind state from this album, you know? So a lot of people hear the new music, even when I say certain references about certain things, people probably, oh, he talking about such and such, but not knowing that shit came out, was recorded last year. So, you know, I just got the liberty of just, I guess it's kind of playing with people's thoughts a little bit. It's kind of fun when I sit back and think about it, though. <laughs> so, on the, the three projects, you have Real is Rare, yeah. I Never Lied, yeah. and you have Reserve for the Real. Reserve for the Real. Yes. So, it has a lot to do with, you know, separating the real from the yeah. fake. Yeah. So, what does it mean to be real to you? Real to me is being that I don't have no, no tape line right now. Real to me is being that we in my store right now. Real to me is writing a love letter to my ex-girlfriend on wax for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to hear, no matter what they think about it, you know? Real is to me that is um, confessing to my fans that I went broke by myself out of contract at one point, you know? Real to me is Telling my homeboy in prison that shit, boy, you have to sit your ass down. Your girlfriend doing this, so you gonna have to sit your ass down. You know, they just, you know, just keeping the, the 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 total truth because I feel like a lot of the raps it's just glorified bullshit that's coming out today. It's like everybody got money, everybody got the baddest bitch, everybody caught the fastest. Everybody weed the loudest, everybody the flyest nigga in the town. Every, and that's not true, you know what I mean? And um when I and the significance 
of me naming my mixtape I Never Lied is because I feel like that's more valuable than a nigga sitting on the mixtape cover with a million dollars cash. Because who knows who million dollars that could be. But the fact that I could say I Never Lied and dare anybody to question that statement mean a lot, you know? And if you've been a fan of Ice Bunny and Bird, you go back to I never lied. I never lied to my fans. You know, I kept it 1,000 all the way from the start. Even from when it comes to, like I said, putting down gimmick plays and um, setting up um, publicity stunts. I never partake in those type of things, you know? So I feel like that's a, that's a trophy within itself to be able to tell the world I never lied. How many rap niggas could tell you that? How many rap niggas done wore jewelry and drove cars and flaunted women and doing this and doing that when it wasn't when you was lying to your fans, you were selling your fans a dream. I never lied to my fans. I kept it 1,000 all the way from the jump since I came out with my first mixtape the 15th one ago. You know, I'm on my mixtape number 15 since I started rapping. And I never lied. I feel like that's a big accomplishment, you know? So, you just said about rap niggas. Would you consider yeah. yourself a rap nigga because on one of the tracks you say maybe you're just not like them, maybe you don't, yeah. you, know, you don't get it, you don't fit in. So, yeah. do you consider yourself a rap nigga? Yeah, I am a rap nigga because that's what I do. I got it tattooed on my skin, but majority of the rap niggas are rap niggas. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? To me, they're rap niggas. Like, I'm, I, I'm a rapper. You know, I rap, you know, I pay my bills off rap. I, I, I'm i in the rap business, but it's just so different from the average rapper, you know? I said, maybe I'm the weird rapper for trying to be a rap mogul. Like, that's weird to some people. Like, some rappers don't even care about the rap business, the music business. And at one point, I was him. You know what I mean? But it just, it's just totally different, man. I'm part of like the, I'm gonna say I'm part of the 10%, probably the 20% out of all rap niggas that really taking the time out to be on the behind the scenes to, you feel me? So I would say, I would say that's like, you know, that's just like all people, all white people ain't racist, you know what I mean? I'm gonna just leave it at that. <laughs> So I know Jay Z is one of your, you know, someone you look up to. Yeah. Does that does he have an influence on the way that you, you know, act in your career, the way you yeah. handle situations, yeah. the way you make your music? Does you know you looking up to him have any kind of influence on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, Jay Z is like a big, big, big influence. More so about his moves, you know. If you listen to my music, you probably won't even think that I listen to Jay Z. You know, I don't rap nothing like it, not even close. You know, um, you know. But as far as like his um his conduct and how he moved and how he came and entered the game and how he um maneuvered through the game and how he was able had to deal with the adversity and the same troubles that I'm dealing with now. Yeah, I look at, I look, I pay close attention to his moves and his past moves and stuff. So, yeah, it's a very, very big influence, you know. I probably more so say I'm inspired by like Trick Daddy and um, Tupac and Lil Wayne musically, as far as like the, the sound, you know. But um, as far as like business wise, yeah, I copy my shit out of Jay Z, especially when I had to go independent and stuff. And as far as the music goes, what would you say for these last three projects were your main influences in that you know came out in the music? Yeah, so these last three projects, and even I even include Flame in this bunch. What I'm about to say is that that was really inspired, influenced by me mostly because, like I say, from 2012 to 2014, I just hid in the studio. A lot of people was thinking I was going to sign to um, MMG at that time. A lot of people was thinking I was going to sign to Cash Money at that time. But I just did the total opposite and just hid. And I um and I just hid in, in the booth. You know, I just took the time to explore different sounds. I took the time to um to to to, 
to experiment a lot with music, you know, and try different beats and different flows and stuff. So I took two years off. I just, I just put it, I just barricaded myself because I knew I was going independent, but I knew that in order to do this shit, I got to have a distinctive, strong, solid, dominant sound, you know, because I was in the studio with Ross. And I'd be like, damn, Ross done mastered his sound, you know, because I used to rock, work with Rick Ross back in the day when I was in high school in like 06. And from his growth, from the time he did, from the time I was working with him in 05, 06, to the time he dropped um, BMF, I'm like, whoa, this dude sound like he done like master his sound and stuff. So Ross like really inspired me to like, man, just work on your sound. Don't worry about your jewelry right now. Don't worry about your cars. Don't worry about none of that. All the party and all the stunt and that shit gonna come. Worry about your sound. So we had bought the studio in 2012 and um, we built up the studio and I just barricaded myself and I put out little songs here and there. I put out a couple little projects, but I was just strictly worried about getting my sound right. So these last four projects is like the monster that I was creating. And now people starting to see it. And it's like, yeah, it's changed, but now it's better. It's more, it's more like put together, compact, packaged up. You know, it's more neat than my old flow. Okay, and how do you maintain that sound while also, you know, including something for everyone in your music? Yeah, um, it's, it's based on like me working with my producer and my engineer. Like I'm like, we done de developed the bond that's like, um, crazy right now because in 2000, well, after I locked, after I locked down in the studio, I started working like through the email heavy with beats, and then my boy DJ came through, my little brother Kimari, and he came through, and he started just um, he would just be there making beats all the time, and me and him built that sound together, you know, because we would uh, just sit in the studio some nights and listen to songs that we like from 2000s and the 90s and the 80s and the 70s. We'll go sit in the studio two hours straight drinking Hennessy, listening to um, Thriller album. You know, getting fucked up listening to Michael Jackson and Trick Daddy and Uncle Luke and just study the whole game. And that's how it just came about. So even we got a wide margin, but we stay within our margin for us like the sounds and the groove we use, you know? It's a wide one, but we stay in it. Like we got it down to the science. Me and DJ, we done, we 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 damn near master. You know, it's about to be a real fun couple next next couple years until our sound get watered out. Cause we about to bring some shit where everybody gonna want to copy. Okay, so speaking of that, the song "Real Spill," one of my personal favorites. Okay. What what how do, how was that song created? Because it has a different energy yeah. when you hear it. Like yeah. it has kind of a a hungriness, like a yeah. grind, just raw energy yeah that's just that's what i'm telling you that's our sound that's that that's the sound that i feel like people gonna want to duplicate and mark my words i'm gonna look y'all in y'all eye right now that in two years and a year and a half you're gonna hear a lot of people making music like real spill and trying to see something and um these other couple bangers we about to put out you know that song was made in literally 20 minutes like I recorded that song, DJ made the beat in like 30 minutes and it took me like 20 minutes to lay the, the, the first verse, the bridge, or well, the first two verses and the hook. 20 minutes tops, I ran straight through it. And it might not sound believable, but y'all gonna see. Y'all gonna see we got more where that came from too. So is there more before the summer ends or do we just have to... I'm trying to drop one next. It depends on when this um, interview comes out. I might end up putting it out a mixtape before you drop this interview. I don't know. Like, I'm turned right now. Like, I got a lot of music. I got a lot of shit coming. I got the name of my... I, I would say the next... Um, this is exclusive. The name of my next mixtape is um, No Sleep for the Underdog. It's crazy too. I'm about to get ready to. We finalizing it right now, but we gonna put it out real soon. It depends on when it's in the new drop. Okay, so do you still consider yourself an underdog? Cause you've been in the game yeah. for quite some time. Yeah, most definitely. Like especially now, like y'all done. They created a a monster. Like I'm a, like a I'm like a, a, a bloodthirsty creature animal from the depths of Dade County coming to destroy 
any naysayers and overlookers, because there's been a lot of those, you know. I'm definitely an underdog, you know. It's hard for me to compete with these rappers that got 30 PRs in one room and 50 computer nerds in the other room and just plugging their music and just throwing shit everywhere. It's hard to compete with those guys. But I'm definitely the underdog. But that still don't affect my record, you know. My record is impeccable, you know. Nobody don't want it with me on no level. I put a, I put out quality and quantity, and I put out um, organic shit. My shit is raw, you know. My shit ain't got no GMOs, no preservatives, all that shit. This shit is raw, you know. So it's hard to even go against what I'm coming with, you know, because my shit is authentic, you know. This shit ain't inspired by no other cultures too much, but the culture that we created amongst ourselves and live house, you feel me? So, you know, they might do numbers, but shit, our numbers are more valuable, you know? You feel what I'm saying? I understand. Yeah. So, your numbers are more valuable, but you're still being overlooked. So, yeah. I saw that you said that, you know, your own city tried to redshirt you, yeah. they tried to blackball you. Yeah. Why, why do you feel that way? Because, man, I feel like my, my city is full of people that just want to be the star, want to be in the limelight. They want to be responsible. Like, my city is one of the most entitled felt cities in the world. Like, everybody just want to feel entitled to something and someone. So when you taking an approach like me, and you grinding on your own and you out there trekking or the, treading the waters on your own and people ain't able to say I'm responsible for him and I'm responsible it's like build like some type of resentment towards that person and stuff and that's what I'm really seeing like you know a lot of studio owners like get mad at me because I don't book with a studio but bro I am a studio owner you know what I mean a lot of these clothing lines and brands get mad because we don't do business but bro we just haven't presented itself because I am a brand owner you know a lot of stores will probably feel feel salty about me because I don't do events in their stores and bro I got my own store you know what I mean a lot of artists get mad because I don't want to do free features with them free features with them but bro I got my own artists that I got to work with for free you know what I mean? So I, I think that a lot of this shit that I'm dealing with is like just really jealousy because I don't rub nobody the wrong way. Like I, I just mind my business all the time. I may do miss a couple industry parties, but these same dudes don't come to my events. You know, I done had a store for two years. My store been open for two years. I don't see none of these industry guys, you know, not even just to say, Damn, let me go to at least see what the fuck he doing, just to like salute a little bit, you know? And it just like drive a wedge between me and the industry, I'm guessing, because I don't, I'm not really dependent on the they, they resources and stuff, you know? And there don't be no bad blood, but I just be, I be seeing certain, certain shit that exclude me on certain things and shit, I guess, because I don't do the extras and shit, but. You know, I ain't tripping on it. I'm gonna just keep balling and keep turning up. My fans love me. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm making my own lane, so. The, 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 um, the more they count me out, the more I just be over here just getting full. You so, feel me? so as far as performances go, you yeah. know, would you say that's the same reason why you aren't booked as much as you should be? Because I feel like being this yeah. is your hometown and you've been in the game for quite yeah. some time, you should be doing more performances, more yeah. shows, and more things. Like but that, that comes from me wanting money. Like, uh -huh. you know, Miami artists and Florida artists, they haven't, they haven't came together and made their demand higher and made them respect it more about promoters. Like, a lot of these promoters call me for these events, but they really be acting cheap as fuck. You feel what I'm saying? Like. Like, I'm a, I'm, yeah. when people book me, I know what I do. I know the following that's going to come. I know the city coming out from media to fans to other promoters, like to the ballers, to the dope boys, you know, to the beautiful ladies. I know what I'm going to draw. 
And a lot of the local promoters really don't respect my price a lot of times. They'll get these guys from out of town that got one or two popping songs. They hold arm, leg, and half a um, lung. Sometimes they cut half of their lung and give it to them for a picture just to say I bought such and such a town. When he ain't really even drawing like that. But me, when I get booked, I'm going to bring 10, 15 people that's going to be in my section and have the time of their life and make your club look good. And all and the people that's coming with me is real tastemakers out of the city as far as like, this girl may have 70,000 followers. This guy might have 20, 30. This guy may have be the, be the head of his football team. This So I'm bringing influencers with me to y'all events. But they still not looking at it that like that on the note. I'm bringing out NFL players to your events if you catch them at the right time. You know what I mean? But they don't look at that, you know, and they don't be respecting my prices. So I'd rather say, fuck it, I'd either do my own events. And a lot of times when you see me doing an event, it'd be my own event. So that go back to, like I was saying, with the branding and stuff too. Like, you know, I'm just self-sufficient and a lot of people don't respect that. They only want to respect my price. You feel me? So where, where are you trying to take your brand? I'm trying to take my brand to the sky. I'm trying to take my brand next to the likes of Cash Money, No Limit, Bad Boy, So So Death, Our Future, Jet Life. Um, ASAP Mob. What else? What else it is? Name them. Rough Riders. Slip and Slide. You feel me? I'm, I live. It's bigger than Ice Billion Bird. Ice Billion Bird is just an artist under Live House. It's just Ice Billion Bird just so happen to own Live House. You see what I'm saying? So I, I want to make this shit big as it could go. And it's going it, it to start with, well, it started with me, but it's definitely not going to end with me, you know? We looking for artists every day. We actively looking for artists and looking for producers to help build our brand. I'm about to build a whole other side of, um, I'm about to bring a, a build a, another room in, in my studio. So by the time that's finished, I have another artist to work in there and then just get bigger and bigger, you know? So... You know, it's gonna be a long journey, but I'm ready to do it for another 20 years if God willing. That's what I'm signed up for right now, to do this shit for 25, 30 years and let my son take it from there. You feel me? Diddy still working. Birdman still working. Ross still working. Master P still working. Puff Daddy Damn, why I said Diddy, Jay-Z still working. So the artists that took time to build their brands, them the ones with the longevity, them the ones who you can't tell, you ain't hot no more, sit down and go work construction. Nah, you ain't gonna be able to tell me that. I hired construction workers to build my building. What the fuck I'm going to hire work for construction for after I done rap, you feel me? So I'm taking a different pro approach at it, you know? It's gonna be a long one, but it's gonna be a plentiful one. We're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna have a whole lot of fun while doing it too. So would you say Ice Billion Bird wants to be mainstream? Is that something that you want to be? If the opportunity presents itself, but I don't, I won't cry if I never become mainstream. You know, the goal is to make a lot of money and disappear, but still be active. You feel me? That's the goal. If I could avoid the big light, I would avoid the big light, you know? But the goal is to make a lot of money and just not, not even be seen. But you're still here about him because you're still hearing, hearing his music and you're hearing his artists and stuff, you know? Like Eminem. Eminem is so big but so in the, um, invisible. Because every time you listen to 50 Cent, uh, Shade 45, or his, um, his artists, um, Slaughterhouse, and all these guys that he got signed under him and stuff. You know, but you never hear the guy, you never see the guy, but he's still, still active. That's my goal. Bruce Wayne shit. Rap game Bruce Wayne, baby. So, you signed Bushy B yeah. to Live, Live House. Yeah. Um, how did that happen, and what led to you signing him? I just, um, I just took, took heed of his sound, man. I was drawn to Bushy B's unique sound, you know. And um, I met him through a, a friend of mine. 
you know, he came up here, matter of fact, he came to the store, he was playing his music on the speaker and shit. I'm like, damn, that's dope. By these stages, he understand the long game, the end game. He understand that we long rehearsing, you know, and I could work with a, a dude like that. You know, I, I probably couldn't work with a lot of artists because um, we ain't after the typical, we not after, after the typical things that a lot of artists is after, you know. We just trying to go, we trying to go, 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 build it up, build it up, build a foundation strong as we can so we can start building walls, whether it take us a good, another year or two to start building walls, you know. We ain't after the, the right now shit. We, we hustling for the long run. So he understand that and that's what really, after a couple conversations and stuff, after a couple um, drunken nights, high nights, and, Creative nights, you know, I decided, like, yeah, this is dude I want my working with. You feel me? You feel me? Because it's hard to get that out of a young dude. And as far as the store goes, we're here right now. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Thanks. Um, So what what was the aesthetic and, like, the idea you had as far as how it visually looks? Yeah. And the products that you, you have here? I just really wanted, I just really wanted a real sleek design. But it, I wanted it to be taken serious. I didn't want no colorful store, but I didn't want no mean vibe. So that's why we got the black and we got the colorful paintings on the wall. You know what I mean? And we kept it gray, but it's not too too serious in here. But I really wanted it to be a classy look, like boutique style store, you know. We got one of each of our product out on the shelves and stuff, you know, on the, um, on the racks. Because it's like a boutique style store, like if you go to a Louis Vuitton, you know, it's a real clean, empty looking space. Uh, any designer store for that matter, it's like real clean, empty looking. But, you know, it's just straight to the point, you know. So I just wanted a real nice, simplistic look, and that's what we got here. And as far as the merch goes, do you design everything yourself? Yeah, I design probably like... I probably design like 70% of, nah, like 65% of everything. I ain't gonna give myself too much credit. But you know, we work with um, different designers, you know. Um, I was with my boy Dope and Gold last night. We coming up with some stuff, you know. Um, plus Gibbons, I, I worked with him earlier. You know, we coming up with some stuff in the future too. So, you know, I work with a couple different designers, but for the most part, it's um, me. And it's just based strictly on what you're feeling at Yeah, it's all about feeling. Everything, all the music is not, it's all about feeling. Like, what's going on, how I'm feeling, how I'm, how I'm moving, how I'm like, what's going on, you know, the, the time. So it's all about feeling, you know, and it, and it play off the music more so. It's really off the music. Like, it follows the tempo of the music. The merch definitely follows the tempo of the music. Okay. So speaking of the music, I saw in one of your interviews that you spoke about Mozzie. Yeah. And you have a track where the thugs be yeah. featuring Mozzie on the project. Yeah. So how did that collab happen? Oh man, I just it was just crazy because I heard about Mozzie. I was in a meeting with Epic Records like um a year ago. And um uh, I was thinking about signing signing with a major at that point, so I had uh, met with Epic Records, um, shout out to Zoe Alicia. And she the one told me about Mozzie and shit. I'm like, damn, when I heard his music, I'm like, oh shit, like this is what I wanna hear, you know, because he was talking about the shit that I that that, that I go through and shit. And um and then I had end up um coming down to Miami and then another dude, my boy Mason, had put me up on Mozzie because he's from Kansas City, so Mozzie was popping in Kansas City, heavy, heavy at that point too. So I, um, I, I, I just kept hearing about him. I'm like, damn. And when I reached out to him, he like, yeah, nigga, I've been knew who you was. I've been rocking with you since MySpace. I'm like, oh shit, that's a surprise. So I'm like, man, we gonna send each other some music and shit. So we started, you know, swapping our music and we kept, um, we keep touching stuff. I'm about to go on the West Coast and vibe, but we might shoot that video you talking about now. So we're going to get that, you know, yeah, you might we're going to get that first? Yeah, yeah, I get that decision, right? I'll you all that. Okay, okay. Do you like Mozzie? Um, that was my first time hearing him on, oh, your, on, oh, your, yeah. on your project. Okay, so, so that means what we're trying to do work, and we're just trying to spread this vibe. Hopefully, people put, he put um, some people on his side 
on my shit, you know? That's what it's about. Yeah, so you tap into his audience, yeah. he taps into yours. Yeah. It's an even exchange. Yeah, the real, it ain't even about the, the exchange, it's just about the real linking. And you know, we draw other, you know, people to, to the movement, you know, because, you know, we, we spit the same vibe. You know, he an independent artist that coming out the streets, you know, that ain't want to settle for less, you know, and building up his own company, got his own artist. I'm doing the same thing on my side. You know, it's about, you know, networking and just bringing it all together. So in these three projects, you share a lot of, you know, your personal stories of, you know, pain or, you know, things that you've been through. Yeah. When you are recording these songs, is it hard for you to, like, revisit some of those memories? Nah. Those? Nah, I'm a realist. Like, I don't, like, I'm like one... Like, even, like, bad stuff and tragedy is right there, you know? A lot of people, it is tough for a lot of people to revisit certain things. But, you know, I accept it, you know. As long as we still here, as long as we still moving, it's going to be good. You know, it's just part of the story, you know. They just gave me another chapter for my book, you know. So it'd be fresh on my mind, you know. I don't even write. So a lot of times when you're hearing that shit, it's like the first thing that come to my mind. You know, I don't really even have time to sit down and think about it. Sometimes I do go back and say, damn, do I really want to say that and delete it or change something if it's just too vulgar, too, like, you know, too real, you feel me? Because sometimes I do keep it too real. And, you know, um, you know, I, I really consider other people's feelings when I put out my music. You know, I don't like to offend a lot of people as much as I used to do. So, you know, I do, like, go back and, like, you know, clean up certain things. But um, it don't affect me at all. You know, it be right on my head. So whatever I'm rapping about, you know, that's just the real. And it's just something um, right there. You know, I got to put it out before I forget about it. Yeah, you have a lot of music for the women on there yeah. as well. So, you know, kind of a nice yeah, vibe. I, yeah, I love the ladies, man. I've always been a ladies, man. I love the ladies. I got to supply them with that good with that good work. The ladies like my gangster shit a lot too, so it'd be crazy. Shout out to the ladies, man. Shout out to the ladies. <laughs> so we're about to wrap it up. Is there anything else that you would want to let the people know? Yeah, just follow me on all my social sites, you know. You up in Miami and just come by the live house store after you get something to eat from finger licking. You know, um, holla at me, follow me on Snapchat. Instagram, cop a shirt, be looking out for that new music, hit me up on YouTube, search Ice Billion Bird, go look at the latest video blogs, we've been back on our video blog shit, I've been opening back up, you know, I, like I said earlier in the interview that it took me two years to, um, it took me two years to, to come out my, go up to like really find myself and find my sound and get my soul right and my sound right. So now that I'm stepping back out my shell and I'm doing things outside the studio, I, I would like to share with the, the fans like I always used to do when I go on trips and get fly and do shows and, and just have fun, you know, and do certain things with the family and stuff. So I'm back on that tip where I'm really putting my life out there more. So y'all look me up on um, YouTube and check out all the billion blogs, man. Wait, so now that you said that, one more question. Yeah. You said that the era of, you know, these internet rappers, kind of, yeah. like, they just go on the internet and spread their music. Yours is more, you know, tailored to the streets. Yeah, I probably did say, well, I didn't say that this is right? No, you did Okay. But I'm bringing it up. Okay. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, how have you, like, adapted to, you know, cater to kind of, you know, the internet or social media yeah. to gain that? Um, I would say... I would have to take that back because if you really think about it, I was an internet rapper, but I was talking, but I was, I based my art around the streets. I ain't based my art around goofy shit. So, um, I can't say that I'm adjusting because I always was social media literate as far as MySpace and YouTube. It's just that around the time Instagram got popping and Snapchat, I'm thinking, and yeah, Instagram more so. 
I wasn't even on the scene like that. I was just really chilling, like I said. So it was like, uh, but now that I'm coming back out, I think that it's going to go very fast because I'm 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 real camera. I'm I'm real. I'm I'm, I'm made for the camera. You feel what I'm saying? So yeah, I could, I won't consider myself like like I'm not an internet rapper. Though. I'll take that back if I said that. I probably did say that. Before. But yeah, I, yeah, I ain't like I never been on TV, a radio. So the only place you would find me is on the internet, honestly. So uh, yeah. I'm sorry if I offended any internet rappers. <laughs> <laughs> there y'all have it. <laughs> so it's your girl Rima, Citrus Rap, coming to you live first. So here we go, Iceberg, my yeah. new favorite. One hundred, man. Y'all stay up. Shout out to Citrus Rap, man. Shout out to you for coming through the live. I'll still have me sure. See you back with a couple of shirts and stuff, man. Y'all all on, man. Biggerbird.com. Holla at me.